You are listening to the Foreign Policy Focus Podcast. We cannot wait for the final proof. The smoking gun could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Haven't you driven enough people from their homes over and bulldoze their villages, seize their property under laws they had no part in making? Now working in Libya with friends and allies, we've demonstrated what collective action can achieve in the 21st century. Now the host of the show, Kyle Inslee. This is episode 430 of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. On today's show, I'm talking about the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act. This is the yearly funding bill for the Pentagon, and it's just full of our tax dollars being spent on needless wars and military equipment and this massive Pentagon bureaucracy, as well as it's spending the Pentagon and giving the executive and, uh, you know, the generals more war-making powers. So, hope you all can share the show. Find it online at the Libertarian Institute. The show, along with the Daily News Roundup that I write, are featured on the homepage, and I do occasionally write featured articles that appear uh, at the Libertarian Institute as well. If you're a new listener to the show, subscribe to it. I got a lot of great content coming up, and I don't want anybody to miss uh, any of the great shows I have uh, in the coming weeks. I will be uh, putting out content over the holidays. I know some other hosts like to take a break, and uh, I see it as an opportunity maybe for somebody who's not uh, quite the biggest name in the libertarian and peace movement having uh, some content out there that people may get to because uh, other people aren't releasing shows. So uh, I hope to have some great stuff over the holidays this year. And then uh, if you want to support the show, patreon.com slash foreign policy focus. All right, today's show will be a little bit different. Uh, as I'm breaking down an article that I actually wrote myself. Um, it's been quite a while since I wrote an article. And uh, I think the first one I really had published in two or three years where uh, Will Porter wasn't my co-author. Although I will say, as always, uh, Will is very helpful in me getting any content out. Uh, you know, just a, a great guy doing some copy editing for me and stuff like that. Uh, so make sure you're checking out Will's work. And I do plan to have him back on the show soon. Begin into this article, it's the 2020 NDAA is a rubber stamp for more war. Find it at the Libertarian Institute. And basically, I start off just saying what this thing is. It came out of conference committee, which means that the House passed a bill, Senate passed a bill. Those bills didn't exactly line up. Uh, so they get together, uh, you know, in, in this conference committee, and then they produce a bill that doesn't look anything like, especially the House bill going in. Overall, this bill is 3,500 pages. So no, not everything that's in this bill is going to be discussed in the show. Certainly wasn't discussed in my article as it's just under a thousand words in length. <laughs> so that's, you know, not even a word per page uh, of this huge document. Uh, the House, I believe, ends up passing it like 19 hours after it comes out of conference committee. And the Senate's expected to pass it sometime this week. I, I think it's slated to be voted on on Wednesday. And so, you know, there's no way any human could possibly read this 3,500 page document, you know, especially as if you're independent and this isn't your day job uh, to try to be informed on, on what Congress is voting on here. But I've been able to pick out a lot of it and I hopefully am able to highlight a lot of the worst stuff in this show. So uh, $738 billion is the money we're giving the Pentagon. Uh, this is a $30 billion increase over last year. I will say this is in total military spending that, you know, for the U.S. anyways. There's the uh, OCO fund, which is basically the war fighting fund seen as basically a, a slush fund for the Pentagon to do what they want with. Uh, the, the care and feeding of the U.S. nuclear weapons is a part of the Department of Energy, actually. And so that, you know, that is in part of this budget. I believe a lot of the, the Veterans Affairs stuff is, is separate and then... Of course, all the actual, you know, like any kind of immigration stuff is tip that funding is separate, although this bill does have some immigration stuff in it, I guess. So to talk a little bit different about what came out of the conference committee, uh, talking about the two bills that went in and actually some good stuff that was in the House bill. Now, it's not like I necessarily was supported the House bill uh, since it was still hundreds of billions of dollars in military funding going on here, but it included things like ending support for the, you know, U.S.'s role in the genocide going on in Yemen. Long listeners to the show absolutely know what's going on. Uh, most people by now have at least some recognition that there's a, a crisis going on in Yemen, I think. Uh, this war's been going on. We're coming up on five years in March. 
Uh, it's been absolutely horrific, brutal the whole time, and has turned genocidal by this point. And so ending the U.S. role in support, supporting Saudi Arabia there would be huge, uh, as Saudi Arabia has struggled to hold on to allies. Of course, when this whole thing started, uh, Qatar was still actually a part of the GCC and in alliance with Saudi Arabia. Of course, the first year of the Trump administration, the GCC fractures and uh, Qatar ends up moving closer to Turkey and Iran uh, to as it was blockaded by the other GCC members, Saudi Arabia, uh, Bahrain, the UAE, and then other countries like Egypt. Well, now th- those talks are being resolved. So that's something to keep your eyes on in the news. But you know, getting back to the NDA in Yemen. Uh, with the the support that Saudi has lost throughout the war, I've even seen reports that the Sudanese have reduced their troop presence in Yemen from 15,000 to 5,000. seems like it would make the U.S. support all that much more critical. And if we start to withdraw that, then uh, maybe then Saudi Arabia really does have to push through and get some kind of deal done with the Houthis. Uh, it's interesting to note that there are talks going on and there's been signals that there's some progress being made. Generally, I guess I'm reading reports of less airstrikes over the past couple of months uh, in Yemen. So maybe there's less bombing going on, but th- th- it's still horrific what's happening there. And all the infrastructure is being destroyed. You can't rebuild the country in the middle of a war. So even if there's not daily bombs going off, that doesn't mean the situation in Yemen is getting any better. And it's probably getting worse as certainly the humanitarian war, the food war against the people of Yemen goes on. There was also something in that bill that would have blocked some weapon sales to Saudi Arabia. This is something that several congressmen and, you know, in the Senate and the House have been working on for years to try to block weapon sales to Saudi Arabia because they're just going to target and slaughter civilians. You know, you would have thought that at the funeral, there was a bombing of the wedding within the first year of the war. You would think that would be enough to weigh people up and make them say, like, we're, we're supporting something here that's violent and awful and evil and we have to get out of it. Nope. Uh, dozens of people die there. Fast forward a, another year and a half hour or so, and you have the, the bombing of a funeral in downtown Sanaa, a uh, funeral hall packed with people. Uh, hit with multiple airstrikes. I've seen the video. It's disgusting and sickening. A hundred or more people dead. Uh, if you look at Western accounts, I think they put the toll there, about 150. Uh, that was enough to get Obama to stop selling them one certain type of bombs, but generally the United States continued to sell Saudi Arabia weapons and provide all kinds of other support for that war, including forcing the blockade, uh, you know, aerial refueling that continued up until I think early this year, or maybe late 2018, but maintenance, logistics, intelligence, all the other things that Saudi Arabia needs to carry out this air war. When Trump takes office, he goes back and allows the sale of weapons that Obama had cut off for that funeral bombing. And then I think it's August of 2018, a uh, bus full of children in a Yemeni sil- uh, city hit with a Saudi bomb likely made by the U.S., killing 40-something children. And that right there, I, you know, thought, well, that that might do it. Now, a couple months later, they, you know, chop up and kill a journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, and that ends up being something that actually starts to generate some momentum into blocking weapons sales in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but nothing's really come to fruition yet. And then we get this inserted into the NDAA. Looks like a victory ripped out during conference committee. Um, so, so that's really disappointing. Now I had already mentioned that the house passed this bill. And so, it, you know, it's quite amazing that as we'll get into this even more, a lot of the, the resolutions that the Democrats have put in there got ripped out and then they voted for it anyways. There were some resolutions in there dealing with the 2001 and 2002 authorization for use of military force. Uh, this is what the U S used to start the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. But, of course, has been used to launch uh, dozens of military interventions from Niger to Pakistan since 2001. So this is something that really needs to it's been a blank check for the White House to do whatever they want with these uh, AUMFs. And uh, Congress was actually looking to rein it in a little bit here. But no, that uh, again gets stripped out of the bill. One of the really helpful articles I read on this um, is by Chris Pebble. Uh, Preble, excuse me, uh, a writer over at Cato on the foreign policy team. He's absolutely excellent. Uh, Preble's article is linked in my article, but he highlights this, uh, 
provision that would have prevent Donald Trump from starting war with Iran without, you know, some kind of authorization from Congress. Now, should need to be said, but it does need to be said. And it was great that that was in there. That doesn't make it into the final version of the bill. This is really important because if we remember, Donald Trump at one point claims to be have been within minutes of, you know, carrying out this strike on Iran before he turned the bombers back. Turns out that that might not be the most accurate narrative, but it was Trump. So it, it is worth mentioning that that's, that's something we should be concerned about is that Donald Trump could launch an aggressive war against Iran. And Congress specifically restraining Trump on this would have been hugely important. Uh, look at the maximum pressure campaign and the situation is it, now created in the Middle East where the U.S. is waging an economic war against Iran. The people are suffering uh, as the re- Iranian people try to, or the Iranian government adds out in response to this. Uh, the U.S. uses those responses as excuses uh, to escalate the situation even more. And Congress should draw a hard line with Donald Trump and say, absolutely no military force without our involvement. I mean, they should force him to repeal the sanctions, too, but that's not going to happen. Something that was supported by uh, House leadership, I believe, going all the way up to Adam Schiff, was this act within the NDA that would have prevented the president from deploying low-yield nuclear weapons. This is something that the U.S. has been developing for the past few years, and these uh, per- present a particular danger as their use would be, uh, quote unquote, like a strategic nuclear strike. Essentially, the, the claim is, is that if we use a small nuclear weapon, it won't trigger a massive nuclear war. And the Russians or the Chinese would say like, oh, you know, hell, what are we going to do? The Americans show that they're, you know, willing to use nudes. I guess reminding the world that we're willing to use nudes. And so we'll bat down and give concessions. I guess, you know, that there's, a claim that this may work because nobody actually knows what's going to happen once nuclear bombs start going off and the other side has them. But it seems like an awful big risk and definitely not worth it. So it would be really important for the you know U.S. Congress to exercise some authority here and say, you know, we don't approve uh, uh, deploying these weapons. It's going to be something you know that's going to end up with other countries developing and deploying more of them uh, like Russia and China. And at a time where we should be working to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons, we're going in the wrong direction. Maybe the biggest headline in coming out of the 2020 NDA is that the Space Force will be the SITS branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. They're getting $72.4 million to build a headquarters. And who knows how much money this year and, you know, a decade from now when we're looking back, how much the Space Force is going to fleece us for. And that's a real problem. That, you know, this is going to just be a bigger drain on all of our pockets, uh, U.S. taxpayer dollars in the U.S. economy, uh, taking a space industry. You know, this is another point about it, is that in something I don't mention in the article, but taking the space industry that's right now uh, in a lot of ways for commercial use and starting to militarize that is going to, I'm sure, be a brain drain on kind of the civilian and technological and just overall you know economic boosting aspect of that industry as the pentagon will just flood it with money we're already seeing this happen with like the big tech industry and you know rather than developing new and different apps to help us and empower our cell phones and make them all that much more useful and cooler uh, they're going to be used for you know developing satellites that shoot lasers that take down other satellites I think the biggest problem is, is once the state, you know, space, which is already, I guess, kind of militarized, but the U.S. creating the, the space force seems like just a concrete step where we could see that, you know, space is becoming more militarized, going to provoke some kind of arms race. I'm sure, you know, especially major powers like China and Russia and India uh, are going to see what the U.S. is doing and try to replicate it because, you know, U.S. having dominance over space, especially if we start sticking nuclear weapons up there, uh, really, I guess, would be domination over the planet below. And that's not something that, you know, people are going to be willing to accept. There's always a, a few things in the NDAA that really don't match what people's expectations of them are. Uh, one of the things is that the NDAA is creating a bureaucracy within the Department of the Defense, and it's going to regulate housing for soldiers. I guess there's, well, soldiers and civilians working for the Department of Defense, which is millions and millions of Americans. So 
I'm sure this is going to be enough to have an impact on at least some markets. Uh, they're going to create a massive database of all the landlords that anybody does business with. So I don't know if, you know, that means you're, uh, you know, just renting from some guy who owns an apartment and, um, you know, he, that's just a little bit of extra income from him. He doesn't go through a housing management company or anything like that. I, I'm guessing that those people are also going to be included in this. So it sounds like this database is going to be massive. They're supposed to provide some kind of ranking system. And then they're really going to start to heavily regulate the agreement between the tenant and the landlord. Uh, seems like this is going to be a huge mess and cause a lot of interference in the market. Uh, that's already got a lot of government interference and causing all kinds of dysregulations and distortions. The article I read on this cited a couple cases where I think there was lead paint and uh, housing didn't have carbon monoxide detectors. And so, you know, th- there is problems with housing, but certainly the Pentagon isn't the place to regulate that. And uh, I'm guessing the more government bureaucracy you have in between the relationship between the tenant and the landlord won't be helpful. The bill gives a 3% raise to soldiers and creates a civilian ROTC program. This sounded a little uh, disturbing to me. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of details on it that I could find. Uh, the bill itself is pretty hard to read and understand. So actually kind of getting and bringing you all news of what's going to come of this civilian ROTC program. It's a little difficult at this point, but it seems like it gives the Pentagon quite a bit of power in, in giving it direction. Uh, there are going to be bachelor degrees offerings at different schools. Uh, this is only going to have a few hundred people uh, enrolled in the first couple of years. They say there's not enough people to fill the positions at the Pentagon, probably because they have way too many of them, uh, you know, positions to begin with, all those millions. And so I don't know if it's going to be helpful. It did say there was some financial assistance. I know that's why some people get into ROTC is, uh, you know, financial assistance from the military anyways. And so this is, I think, just going to feed more people into the Pentagon, kind of talking about the brain drain with the Space Force before. Uh, something I guess you see from college campuses. Also, you know, the, the people are, I guess, a lot of people who end up in this are going to be the people with no other option, kind of like those who ends up going into the army. Uh, financially, you just don't have a choice. And because of the skyrocketing prices of college, uh, you're going to be forced into programs like this to pay for it. One of the <laughs> issues that has seemingly nothing to do with the military, and I don't think it does, is that they're going to provide 12 weeks of paid family leave uh, to all federal employees. So that's, you know, getting a lot of uh, attention, uh, big celebrated by Trump. So just to note that the sentence expected to pass, you know, they do these like consensus and they have an idea that uh, the sentence is going to pass this. Trump's already celebrating on Twitter. So it seems like this bill will become law within the next week. A couple things I don't talk about in my article uh, that I want to mention here is that there was some border security stuff in the bill that Trump celebrated having in there. Uh, and then there was a pretty good breakdown of some of the more liberal issues. Uh, and for that reason, I did include my article. I would say progressive issues and not use that word to <laughs> offend some of my left-wing listeners. But, you know, some of the issues like transgender in the military, apparently they passed a ban in this bill. And it, it is interesting, as Jimmy Dore points out and just something that we see with the rest of this, that uh, something like when Donald Trump initially announced banning transgender people from the military, there's this huge outrage by the left. Well, that's because you're kind of looking at a singular issue. But now if it would come up to, you know, holding up the the creation of different government bureaucracies, the space force, uh, giving the president more war making power, stuff like that. Well, then they don't care quite so much about transgender people. There's a good article by David DeCamp uh, that's uh, at news at antiwar.com. And um, there he points out that there's some pretty bad Russia stuff in this. And one of those is providing more military aid to Ukraine. Looks like $300 million in total, a $50 million increase over last year. In another article, I read that a uh, hundred million of the the three hundred million will be in lethal aid. So these are you know shooting weapons uh, that includes javelin missiles and possibly anti ship missiles. This could be important if you remember uh, back to I think spring of this year where there was the incident in the Kerch Strait where some Ukrainian ships violated the 
rules set forth by Russia from crossing into the Black Sea to the Sea of Azov through the Karch Strait. Uh, this led to a little military confront, confrontation there. Different political circumstances, maybe the Ukrainians tried to escalate and they have these U.S. anti-ship missiles to do it, could draw the U.S. into a bigger conflict with Russia. There's also in this bill a requirement for Trump to sanction ships that are helping, uh, I guess, install and get ready the new Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is going to bring natural gas from Russia into Europe uh, by pipeline, probably far cheaper than the U.S., far more reliably th- than the U.S. can. And so, you know, kind of Trump's mercantilist policies are kicking in and he's looking at trying, well, Congress at least is looking at trying to cut this off. And Donald Trump seems to be going along with this bill, so I'm assuming he's uh, supporting these sanctions as well. The one positive I could find in this bill is that there's a provision that's going to require the government of the U.S. to have any country that we agree to sell nuclear technology to to agree to international inspections. I'm hoping that this resembles the you know kind of one two three agreement. That way, we're not giving Saudi Arabia the technology to uh, you know the civilian nuclear energy technology that they you know could one day use to make a bomb. While that has been the standard in the past. We've seen the Trump administration a little bit more shaky on this. And while the Saudis have outright refused to accept a one, two, three agreement, they have received some uh, nuclear information from the U.S. One of the worst parts of this whole bill is uh, a provision called Caesar's Bill. And it is basically a regime change bill for the Syrian war that they've been trying to pass for several years. It's going to sanction uh, you know, Assad, the Syrian government, Iran, and Russia for committing war crimes in Syria. The big deal I see is that this law is going to prevent, like, Syria from being rebuilt after the war. No international groups that potentially want to receive secondary U.S. sanctions will be able to do business with Assad. Um, and that means the Syrian state, because if you look at it, he, you know, he's got this civil war won. Uh, his forces, you know, have made some progress in the past couple of weeks, taking territory in the Idlib province. This is Al-Qaeda's last real stronghold. And Russia forces within the past week entered Raqqa, Syria, the former capital city of the Islamic Caliphate, once occupied by the U.S. along with our uh, Syrian YPG allies as the U.S. has changed its mission in Syria uh, from occupying territory with the Kurds to securing Syrian oil for some crazy reason. Raqqa got opened up, taken back by Russia. Russia is an ally of Assad, so you would assume that his troops are moving further east in Syria uh, securing more territory that's not held been occupied by U.S. forces at this point. When talking about sanctioning Syria for war crimes, uh, one thing you have to remember is that while Assad waged a brutal war and you know is definitely a war criminal and not the greatest guy, he was fighting against the jihadists that the United States supported in overthrowing him, who were you know talking about committing ethnic cleansings and genocides in Syria, and so. When Assad was, you know, carrying out these war crimes, you know, dropping barrel bombs on people and, you know, fighting in, you know, acting in a way where he was willing to kill civilians, especially I think civilians who were loyal to or, you know, sympathetic towards the Syrian resistance, again, largely made up of Al-Qaeda. The conditions in the Syrian jails are terrible. Uh, But again, all this started because of the U.S., Turkish, Qatari... Uh, support for the Syrian opposition uh, that created all the the jihadists and ISIS and the problems. Also, the biggest claims against the Assad government, uh, the chemical weapons attack, uh, are unsubstantiated. And, you know, now the the one they had was Duma, and the OPCW is full of leaks with people coming out and saying that that report was garbage, and there's really no evidence to indict uh, Assad over that. Last thing I'll mention here is the U.S. has committed war crimes in Syria. We know bombings of mosques and, you know, killing civilians, thousands of them or over a thousand of them as they try to uh, support our Turkish or, yeah, Syrian, Kurdish, excuse me, allies on the ground with our airstrikes. And so, you know, if we're sanctioning people for carrying out war crimes in uh, Syria, we should look at the Pentagon first. All right, everybody, that's what I have for you. Uh, there's a lot of other bad stuff in the NDAA uh, that I don't know about yet, but as uh, you know, I find out about it, I'll bring it to you in future shows. As I said, I think I got some great shows coming up, so make sure you subscribe to it. 
Check out my work at the Libertarian Institute. I am the assistant opinion editor at antiwar.com. I'm on Twitter at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E. And there's a private Facebook group called Foreign Policy Focus.